Good morning. So today we're looking at the um, scripture where we as the church are described as, as a body. And the Apostle Paul is writing this letter, the scripture that Kent read. Uh, he's, he's writing this letter to the church that meets not in Beverly, but in Corinth. Corinth, this big city in Greece. And every church has its stuff that it goes through, right? Just like how every family has its drama. You think of your family. We all have our stuff. And every, any group that comes together for some common purpose have their, has their stuff that they have to work through. And Corinth is certainly like this. So in this New Testament letter that, that Paul wrote called 1 Corinthians, as a pastor, he's helping them to reimagine who they are. And he does this using a metaphor. He says, you know how a body is made up of many parts? He says, well, that's you. And, and that is us. We are many individuals. And each one of us comes with our own perspectives. We come with our own experiences, our biases. We come with our own set of needs, our own baggage. We come with our own gifts, and we come with our own capacity to contribute to the whole. But we are also one. We're like one body. So yes, we are many, and we are one. We're one, and yet we're so different from each other. And in the book that we're following for this year's theme, and from which I'm drawing from for this sermon, God, Improv, and the Art of Living, Dana, the author, she introduces us to three different types of improvisers in the world of improv, or, or three different types of people just in life as we deal with one another in a group. And the first group she calls pirates. Now, pirates can be fearless, they can be unpredictable. They're willing to basically just put it all out on the line. They, they take a risk. They just go for it. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're like that. Or maybe right now you're thinking of somebody that you know who's kind of like that. You know who's a good example of a pirate in the Bible is uh, Peter, uh, the, the, Jesus' disciple, Peter. There's a story that's at the end of the Gospel of John where uh, it takes place where after Jesus has died and after Jesus has rose from the dead. And some of the disciples, they're in a boat and they're fishing. There's Peter, there's John, and then there's a handful of others. And, um, and in, this, in this story, uh, John is fishing with them. But he's, John is paying attention, right? And he sees out, way out on the shore, he sees somebody and he realizes who, who it is. It's Jesus, he says. And as soon as Peter hears this, Peter gets up and he jumps in the water and he starts swimming for the shore. That's Peter. That's how he is. And everybody else is like, uh, pretty sure the boat can get us there. But Peter just jumps right in. That's him. He's like all in. He's like a pirate. He's fearless, unpredictable. But Peter is awesome that way. Uh, but um, what if all the 12 apostles were like that. That would not be, uh, all, all of the disciples were like that. That wouldn't be a good fit. So you need, uh, you need people that are pirates, but we can't all be pirates. So we need other types too. So we need the second type that Dana in this book she talks about. We need that type, what Dana calls robots. Now, <laughs> there's a new one on Netflix too, uh, Lost in Space. If you haven't seen that, um, I don't know if you should see it or not. I watched a couple episodes. Not that good. But you have to keep in mind, when she, in this book, says robots, she's not speaking of it in a derogatory kind of way. Like, sometimes we talk about robots like uh, emotionless, you know, or, or um, lifeless, and that's not really what this is about. Dana is describing uh, some of us as robots, saying that there are some people that are the logical ones. Or they, the, 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 it's those people that they kind of like bring things down a little bit. They, they ground us in reality. Or they bring things back down to earth. Maybe that's you. Maybe as I'm describing that, you're thinking, yeah, I'm kind of like that. 
Maybe you know somebody who's like that. And it takes all types. It takes pirates, people who are just, they'll just jump in. It takes robots, those who can like, just kind of like put the brakes on when it's needed. My wife and I right now, we're really excited about something that's coming up. Our oldest daughter, Ari, uh, a few months ago, has, is now engaged to be married. And so they're, they're, but they're planning a quick wedding, um, like this summer, in July, in like five months, five months from now. And it's really exciting, and, uh, and, and Ari has all these ideas, because she's a creative type, and she has all these cool ideas of how she wants the ceremony to be, and of how she wants the reception to be and stuff, but, but also, we got all those great cool ideas, but also we have to be realistic, right? And so my wife, Linda, has been really good at um, being a sounding board for our daughter, Ari. Um, you know, what, what can we really do? And, and in this short time period, you know, what can we really pull off? And what can we really do with limited resources? So Linda, my wife Linda, has this role, in this case, as like a robot. She's helping to bring the vision of the wedding uh, down to earth so it'll be a success. And we need that. We need that in this situation. And we need that in our community. We need robots. So if that's you, you're important to the community. So there are pirates that are just all in. There are, there are robots that help to ground us in reality. And then the third type that Dana introduces to us are the ninjas. Now, ninjas, you don't, you don't really see ninjas much, right? Because they're ninjas. And you don't really hear them much. But when you do, when they do say something, it's usually good, right? You could probably think, think of someone like that. They're, maybe they're quieter. But then once they finally speak up, it's like, ooh, that's good. And they do small, subtle things, things that matter, and, and things that improve the work of the pirates and of the robots. I remember when I was a little boy, I, uh, I was in my room uh, in the house that we grew up in, and um, my teenage older brother, Steve, he, he pokes his head in my, in my doorway, and he walks in, and um, he was totally serious. It wasn't like a joke or anything. He goes, um, I have some bad news. And I, I'm like, oh, no, what? And he said, the Beatles broke up. And uh, even, <laughs> even as a little kid, I remember I just loved the Beatles. He did, too. They were a big part of our culture back then, right? I mean, it wasn't just me. Who else? Beatles fans? Either you used to be? Okay, come on. You know who you are, right? But John and Paul and Ringo and George, they were the best, weren't they? So you have John Lennon and you have Paul McCartney. Um, they're, like, they're like the fearless ones. They're the songwriters, right? They're the ones who are they're just uh, risk takers. You know, like when you... When you do anything creative or songwriting, or like you're, you're laying, you're, you're vulnerable, right? You're laying it out on the line, but you're just, you're just doing it. You're just taking a risk. They were the creative energy, really, behind the band, the Beatles. They were all important, but they were like the creative force behind the Beatles. Sounds like that description that Dana has of pirates, doesn't it? And then you think of Ringo. Ringo's kind of keeping everybody grounded in their pers personalities, right? Even, even like, even that, that backbeat, you know, and then that kick drum, you know, he's kind of like keeping things right there, right on the ground, right? Sounds like that robot. And then you think of, then you think of George Harrison. He, he didn't stand out too much, did he? Kind of in the background. He, did, he didn't need to be flashy. But like a ninja, he'd come in with that perfect guitar part right when it was needed, didn't he? So Dana's description of these three different types of people, the um, pirates, the robots, the ninjas, it can really be helpful for us to understand ourselves and for us to understand us as a church and as a group. So I, I have a question for you is, do you, do you feel like maybe you fit into one of those? You might not, but do you feel like you maybe fit into one of those? And, and sometimes we vacillate to go from one to another depending on the situation, too, depending on what's needed, depending on who else we're interacting with. But really, it takes, it takes all three types in a community. 
It takes all types. It takes many types. So yes, we, we are many, and we are one. And in this church community here at FBC Beverly, we are, as the apostle says, the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. It takes all types to make us who we are, and we all play a part. And your part, your part has to do with all sorts of things. It has to do uh, with your, your temperament, your role, those, or those certain unique qualities that make you you. It has to do with the way that you serve in the church. It has to do with how you express your spirituality. You know, are you, are you like on the far end of introversion, right? Are you an introvert? That part of you is important. You belong. You're needed. That part of you is needed. Are you on the far end of extroversion? You know, you're, you're an extrovert. That part of you is important. You're needed. You belong. Or maybe you're somewhere in, maybe you're like a lot of us, that you're somewhere in between there. As that type of person, your temperament in that way is important. You belong here and you're needed for this church. So whether you're a, a pirate or a robot or a, a ninja, you belong and your part is important for the health of this community, this church. But it's not just our temperament, you know, other ways that we're different. Maybe you're an organizer, right? You like to make a plan, a strategy, and you, then you break it down into steps. Not everybody's wired that way. Maybe instead you just take it as it comes. You, you use your intuition. And both of those ways are important. Both of those types of people belong in, this, in our process together, in our needed. And the things that we do, the roles that we have. Maybe you serve in the church to help with overseeing the finances. Maybe that's your role. Maybe, maybe you help to prepare uh, food for before and after the service. Maybe you do stuff that's behind the scenes that nobody ever sees. Or maybe you do something that's up front for all to see. We're all needed and we all belong. You, you know that I'm a, a carpenter, right? I'll tell you that before. I work with my hands, my two hands. I need them both. And I've been in this line of work for a long time. And, and, and some years back, I was on this job. It was a particular job where I was a contractor on the job, but I was working as a subcontractor for a larger contractor. And I had this job to do. I was re going to rebuild a porch, and there was a, a roof up high overhead, and I was going to rebuild a lot of the carpentry and the cornice and part of the roof structure that was above. Now, I'm a, I've been doing this a long time, right? So I'm a pretty picky guy. I got my ways, you know, I have certain ways that I like to do things. And, um, but the other, this other contractor, he was, he was kind of micromanaging too much. Have you ever been in that kind of situation where somebody's kind of like breathing <laughs> down your neck and you're like, I know what I'm doing, just leave me alone. And so I was going to set up the ladders and the staging a certain way, uh, the, the way that I felt like was efficient for the job and safe for me. And he specifically had a way that he wanted it done, right? And, which isn't normal. You usually you don't micromanage to that extent in this kind of work. But uh, he did. And I just didn't feel comfortable with it, you know? I didn't feel like it was going to be safe. Like, it was efficient. It looked good that way. But it just didn't feel like it was going to be safe. And I was the one that was going to be up there, not him. But I, I, I ended up, um, I, just, I just went along with it, right, for whatever reason. And this was a cold winter month. We had about that much snow on the ground. And, uh, and on the porch, one side, the, the ground sloped away like a, like a hill on one side of the porch. <clears throat> and he assured me that if, if, I, if I set up the ladders his way, that if I just got the feet of the ladders and, and jammed them in the snow, it, even though it was on a hill, that, that, that they would be fine. He's like, they're not going nowhere, Donato. Don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. He assured me that it wasn't going, going to go anywhere. And I'm like, I don't know. Maybe like some ice under there. I don't know what's under there. But I tend to be overcautious. But still, it just didn't feel right. 
So I figured, okay, well, I was going to set up everything else the way I like it. So I set up my tools the way I like it. I got my workbench over here. I like to put a trash barrel right under the ladder so that I can drop my scraps in when I'm up there. So I kind of had everything else set up that way. And I, I'm using the staging and I'm using the ladders. And it's like, eh, I guess it's okay. You know, it was, it was fine. No, there wasn't any, any problem um, safety-wise until about maybe like the third day. And uh, it was somewhere around the third day, and uh, I'm, up on the <laughs> I'm up on the ladder. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, the, the feet that are digging into the snow, the feet of the ladder start to give way. And I fall off the ladder. And I don't know how it happened all so fast. I don't know how this happened, but I somehow, I ended up in the trash barrel that was underneath me. <laughs> It's kind of cartoonish, and I think my, it felt like my head limbs like sticking out, like parts of my body, or so my leg or an arm sticking out. And I mean, it was good because the barrel broke my fall, but it, I didn't escape this thing without uh, any other breaks. I was in pain and my hand really hurt. I went to the hospital, and it turns out like right here is a little bone that relates to your pinky. You know, you don't think your pinky is much, right? But it's this little bone here that's, that's connected to that as part of that. And, uh, and it was broken. And um, so now I, 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 you, I work with my hands, right? My hands, not just my hand. I work with both of my hands, and I need them both. And I discovered very quickly that to work the way that I do, <clears throat> this entire hand, basically, it was now useless. Just because of that one, just because of that one little bone until the, until the bone was healed. And then since this hand wasn't working, this hand wasn't able to do the work of both hands. In verse 22 of the scripture, it says, those parts of our body that seem to be the weaker are indispensable. Those parts of our body that seem to be the weaker or less important are indispensable. I wouldn't have thought that that little bone in my hand <laughs> leading to my pinky would bring my income to a screeching halt. But it did, just this little bone. This insignificant part of my body, it, proves to be, it proved to be indispensable for the kind of work that I do. For the kind of work that I do, I need both of those hands. And there are roles in our church, in, our, in, in, in temperaments, that we might think of being weaker or maybe less important, but they are indispensable. They're vitally important. You are important. You belong. And your uniqueness that makes you, you, is needed here. Now, I've been here for about three years, and I, from Sunday to Sunday, I see a good amount of people that have started coming here since that time. Now that you are a part of this body, as Paul calls it, what part are you? Based on your makeup, based on who you are, your temperament, what you like to do, what gives you joy, what brings you life, what part of you? What part are you? Because you belong here and your perspective is needed. And then, some of us who aren't so new, I want to just humbly suggest or throw out to you that maybe you have been serving in the church for, in a certain way over the years. it has been a blessing. But as a follower of Jesus, you have grown and you've changed. And I wonder if it's time for you to consider serving in a new way, to step out in faith. Maybe you're ready for a role that you didn't feel that way about before. Maybe beforehand you didn't feel like you were Christ, but maybe if you step out in faith, maybe you are. Maybe it's time. Because the body is made up of many parts. So what part are you? What part are you now? Because in verse 18, it says, In fact, God has arranged all the parts of the body, 
every one of them just how he wanted them to be. God has arranged that. God's in control. We can trust that God is in control. We don't have to worry because God has a purpose. And you are here for a reason. You belong. You're needed. And we're not in this alone. In fact, the Scripture says that that Christ is the head of this body, the church. So this isn't just a social experiment that we're doing. I mean, it kind of is, in a way, a social experiment, but it's more than that. God is at work here. This community and the work that we're doing in the larger community is something that God is doing. And we all have a part in it. Lord, we ask that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear, minds that change, and hearts that are moved. Amen.